Welcome to the fifth presentation on the, from the Atlantis course. This one is on the structure of Atlantis's code, a little bit on how you write C code in the first place and how to interact with it, so that you can understand the best way of stepping through the code. As I've said previously, being able to get into the code and see exactly what it's doing at any one time is a far more efficient way of working with Atlantis, particularly during calibration, than just changing parameters, pulling the handle and seeing what's different. Like all uh, C programs, Atlantis has a main routine that calls the other subroutines that basically structure the whole rest of the program. It starts with a initialization a set of routines that set the model for configuration up and loading the parameters and then it gets into a loop that dictates what the whole rest of the model is going to be doing through time and it just loops through all of those continuously until it gets to the end, end time step of the model. Under each one of those major routines a whole bunch of subroutines that deal with specific individual processes or tasks. That's a much easier way of maintaining the model and understanding what's doing is to have individual tasks broken out to their own routines, even if they're fairly chunky routines, so that you can understand what's doing. If it's all in one huge enormous routine, then you're going to get really lost. So the initialization basically sets up the run configuration from your CSV and parameter, run parameter file. Then it reads in the geometry, the physics, which helps set up the, the um, information needed to create the initial conditions arrays. Then reads the initial conditions netcdf file to fill in those starting variables. From there it creates arrays to store both the output but also the species and fisheries parameters. It then reads in those parameters while also creating the output file so that it's got places to put that information. The structure of the output files is based on some assumed structures around the Atlantis data structure itself, the whole Atlantis database, so to speak, but also information stored in the initial conditions file. Uh, then after you've done all of that, you can finally initialize the model and be ready to start. The first step of every uh, loop of the model is to look at the record the state of the model, basically get ready to store output. So that's all the physical characteristics or physical variables, then the biological ones, then the fishery statistics, such as catch and effort. The very next thing it does is to check the timestamp inside the model. So what time of year is it? What time of day it is it? So that it can appropriately trigger the right species at the right time or do calendar events such as recruitment or spawning at the right time. It does at this point check the activity state. So if you're an animal that's not active at night, it changes state about what you can do and what you can't do. Uh, equally, when you're in the daytime, it, it streamlines a different set of states. It also at that point does any parameter scalings or corrections based on the ambient environment. So things like the nutrient processes, metabolism, all those kind of things are dependent on what the temperature, salinity, pH, oxygen and all that is. You get different values under different states. Or if you've read in any scaling properties like scaling natural mortality as a part of a time series, all of those corrections happen at that point. The next thing to do is to check if the assessment model is on and if it is, is to do some data collection. Uh, annually it would do stock assessments and count calculate other indicators and things like that it's a very it, it's not executed every time step unlike the others there's a whole bunch of checks around when it does need to activate the frequency with which the different steps uh, happen is dictated by what they are so assessments are typically annual but some of the other things like data collection are based on a survey design that you actually include in your assessment parameter file The next step is the fleet dynamics. You have to do this before you do the biology, so all the fishermen are in place so that you can execute the, the fisheries mortality. You The steps involved in doing that is to consider any fisheries management actions that need to take place, particularly on the annual cycle. Then there's some catch per unit effort updating, which is used by the socioeconomically driven harvest control. Uh, so harvest um, model, but also by some of the simpler harvest models, particularly those that use catch per unit effort to direct where their activities will be. Then finally you do the actual effort allocation 
uh, which in some cases is just spatial F or fishing mortality. In other cases, it's true effort that has to be further interpreted to apply as a mortality rate. Then you get on to the biology time steps, which step through setting up what the physical conditions are in any one location, then doing any movement, both horizontal and vertical, before it gets into the individual processes happening at any one specific location, including all the nutrient cycling, any individual growth and mortality, uh, any other behaviours and habitat dependencies and things like that, and then the application of not just predation mortality, but also fishing mortality. Periodically, based on a calendar of events, it also does reproduction. So both movement and reproduction can be on a calendar event that's in superimposed on all the other ecological activities that are happening. The last library to be called is the physics library that does looks at all the physical processes uh, and moves things around, ultimately particularly uh, passive suspended things like plankton and detritus and nutrients basically get the situation all set for the next time step uh, which will be recorded at the start of the next time step. So just trying to break that out a little bit so you can see it all at once. You can see there's quite a few processes happening as you flow through that um, particular set of actions. So a single time step would go through or a single event run would go through all of those steps but in reality it loops around quite a few times between record state and physics before you get to the end state, which is either when the delete to halt run file is removed or you get to the t-stop value that you put in your run parameter file. So that's the basic uh, setup of the code. Um, hopefully it follows uh, logic for you. Now before we start to dive into the code itself, I'm going to give you a very quick 101 on how C code works. So the very simplest rule to remember is that every single line of code has to end with a semicolon. If it doesn't have a semicolon, it assumes because it's flowing on to something else and will eventually need a semicolon. So just make sure that you always put a semicolon at the end. It's the bit that trips up most R coders is they forget this. The next part is that you need to put in braces to bracket up what's happening where and make it clear where a command applies. The modern GCC compilers will even get upset if you don't do this bracketing. Those brackets are super important though and if they get out of whack, things just do not compile properly. So you stay, have to stay really on top of making sure you pair up any braces and make sure you put in your semicolons. This also shows you the basic layout of an if statement. So you've got if and then a test of the thing you're looking at. For instance, A is greater than B. If that's true, it will go in and do the code in here. Um, you don't have to have the else statement. That could be sufficient alone if you didn't want anything else to happen if the statement up here was untrue. You can, however, have this option where if it's this, you do this. Otherwise, you do everything down here. So that's the if then else, that's a fairly common approach to programming. Another thing that uh, is fairly common in programming is the for loop, which is you iterate a value up and while this statement is true, so you're starting at zero and it iterates one step at a time till it gets to, uh, till it fails this test. So uh, once, while this statement is true, it does the code statements in here. There are some other kinds of loops, but they're the two main ones that you'll need to worry about. Another major thing that you'll find in the code is that I like to try and give myself lots of messages about what's going on, so there's lots of comments in the code. Comments that stretch across multiple lines start with a hash, a slash and a, a asterisk and end with another slash and a so an asterisk then a slash. They can be quite large chunks. In some places I've got like you know, half a page of text in there trying to explain the logic of where it's come from, the parameters that are used, maybe even the source material like references that I've got it from. Other single line comments, often when I'm commenting out an old piece of code or coming out in an fprint, are just double slash and that will just comment out a single line. Even if you've got a half an if statement, it'll still put the rest of it down here. So if you want to comment out a line by line you do this and if you want to comment multiple lines you have to do this other method. 
There is another kind of comment you'll see in the code. It's a to-do comment, which actually starts with this um, tracked one. In many user interfaces that do coding, like Eclipse or Xcode, these to-dos are tracked, uh, and the UI itself keeps a list of them that you can consult to see what you've still got to fix. They're a way of leaving yourself a, a commented to-do list uh, without having to keep a separate program going. There are a range of words that C has a special meaning for and you can't use these to mean anything else in your own code. Many of them are to do with kinds of variables or particular actions. So you'll see that if and for are in there, the else is in there, uh, while is in there, those while loops. Switch is a really useful one. It's And it's one you'll see a fair bit in the code. It's like a mammoth if then else. So you can put... Uh, in a basically a list of different options. We'll step through an example of that when we look at the code, uh, but it's a, it's one you'll see a lot. Continue is where you sk basically skip ahead inside a, a loop. Uh, you basically say you do a test. If you want to continue the loop, but not for this particular instance because the test just say you only want to do it for mature fish. So you check if the fish is mature first. If it's a juvenile, you don't want to break the loop because you want to get on to the mature fish. But you don't want to execute, execute all of the code if it's meaningless for the juvenile fish. So you hit continue to jump ahead. On the flip side, if you have a case where once you've met that requirement, you need to break out of the loop and go do something else, that's when you would use a break statement. There's lots of different types of numbers and uh, values inside Atlantis. There's integers uh, or shorts. Short integers, shorts and longs hold integer values. They're just uh, the memory assignment is different, so you can get a different range of numbers you can get to. Whereas float double and long double are to do with real numbers, numbers with decimal points. Uh, you can see that they have quite a, a larger range. Um, and when you're calling these in a uh, print statement, you also have to do it in a slightly different way, which hopefully again we'll get to have a look at as we step through the code. There are some other things that you need to know about, like defining variables. Often when you have a compile problem, it's because something hasn't been defined properly properly or is defined even but not used and a whole bunch of other things like that where the message will come up. There's different ways of defining things. There's as a, um, a global that's available everywhere and there's also some pre-compiled sort of constants defined. This is how I do it a lot for options of variable names. So instead of having saying option 0, option 1, option 2, which is actually how C thinks about it, you define a name and then match it to the value so that you can put in an English meaningful English word or a meaningful word to match the value so you can understand what the code's doing. And I'll explain that when we get to the switch statements. You also need to define all the other parameter names and things like that that you're going to use. Uh, there's slightly different ways of defining them um, depending on what it is. But for anything that's just a number, you basically say what kind of number it is and then the name of the thing you want to do. For strings, characters, things like that, there's a few different ways that you can define what those look like. Um, they're a bit trickier to work with in the main, but they're not too hard to define. This is basically if you're not giving it a special size ahead of time. This is if you're giving it a certain size to start with. And this is not only giving it a certain size, it's actually assigning the value straight up. You can do these kind of definitions either in a header file at the top of the C file to make them available. If you do it in a header file, they can be pretty much referred to anywhere. If you do it in a C file, it's true for the rest of that file, unless you do some cross-linking. And then if you do it inside a routine, it's only available inside that specific routine. In terms of where you need to define it in a routine, we typically just define it at the start of the very head of the routine. That's to make sure it's always defined before you use it, but also because the Windows machines in particular will throw an error if it's defined elsewhere in the, in the program. Whereas Linux and Unix are typically okay so long as you define it before you use it. 
There's a whole bunch of operators that you can use in C, um, the typical kind of mathematical ones, some to do with binary, some that allow you to do a shorthand in doing mathematics like iterating or deprecating instead of having to write it out long you, there's some shortcut commands for that in effect then there's a whole bunch that you use when you're doing a test like in an if or an else kind of statement which is the biggest ones to remember are if you want to say something equals something else in a test and ask if that's true you need to put equals equals if you only put a single equal sign then you're actually making one equal to the other rather than testing whether they're equal. So it's a pretty important one. The other one is not equals, which often comes up. The more common tests are less than and greater than, though you can have the less than equal than, greater than equal than. There's some other ones too, like this is an and, and this is an or test. This one here is a special kind of test expression. It's not used very much in Atlantis. You do see it a tiny little bit. So you'd have is you'd have your expression that you want to test, then the question mark, then the answer if the value is true, and then the answer if the value is false. So it's a very fast way of writing an if statement. The vast majority of the code is drawn up using functions and to see what a function looks like, you define what kind of number it's going to spin back. So in some cases, it's actually returning a real number, like down in this example here, where ecology get plankton is returning a value for plankton, which is a double. So this is a double. You can have an integer return, where it's returning like an uh, integer number, yes, no, or a solid value. Most of the routines that you'll see in Atlantis are what they call voids, which mean you can certainly put in a return to say, okay, I'm done and pass you back to the bigger program, but you don't actually have to because at the end of a void, it's not going to send back a message. Everything it had to do is done within the body of the routine and it doesn't need to return a specific value. There are a heap more features to C where it gets more and more complicated, particularly around memory allocation and memory freeing, which is not something that you have to worry about in lots of other kind of languages. There's also pointers where you're actually passing memory addresses and this is particularly used with arrays and things like that and pointers to functions. Um, if you want to know more about that, just ask. It's not something I'm going to cover here because it can get quite complicated really fast. Um, I will go through discussing what a structure and a type def is while talking through the Atlantis code, but most of it is stuff you don't really need to know straight off the bat. However, I will note that if you're printing out a value and you see a number like this one here, so a little number, then the number e to the 308 or plus 308, basically once these numbers here get enormous, it's much, rather than thinking it's ridiculously small or large piece of biomass, it's far more likely that you've passed a memory address, not the actual value. Uh, and that's because um, you might have accidentally clipped an array or you haven't quite referenced a pointer properly. It, it's easily done, but it's mainly doing F prints by accidentally typing that you want to print out a double instead of an integer or something like that. So it's worth keeping your eye on. So in the code itself, as I mentioned there'll be lots of comment strings. I try to use English meaningful names. So the matrices in Atlantis are represented with array names with the i, j, k defining the dimensions. The main way of checking what's going on in Atlantis is to actually get in and print out what that looks like. Um, so print statements or well, print f statements go straight to your screen. F print f statements go to a file. So, and this first entry here is the file name, or the pointer to the file, rather. Uh, BM log file or log FP, the most common ways it's referred to throughout the entire code. If it's been passed into the routine, it'll probably come in with this particular name. If it's not been previously passed into the routine, it should still be findable by calling bm log file. Again, we can have a bit of a look at this once we actually start to go through the code. 
inside a print statement, you first of all explain what you want to print out. So you have the name of the thing you want to print out or the string that you want to print out. And then you tell it what format the thing is. So this is an integer, this is a double or a float, and then this is a string. And then you give it the actual name of the thing you're really printing. So it might say this is the human readable name and this is the Atlantis code name for that same thing. We'll show you what I mean uh, in the actual code. So what we'll do now is we'll stop uh, the presentation or the PowerPoint for a second and actually go have a look in the code. And then when we come back, we'll have a look at some calibration examples. So this is uh, the Atlantis code. I do it through the Xcode app. Down on the left hand side here are all the different library names and you can see that they're broken out based on the topic that are dealing with. There's a whole bunch here to do with how you um, have to uh, compile it in a Windows back in when it really did use to compile in Windows. Then you've got a bunch more libraries. You've got the configuration file for how you uh, compile Atlantis and then the make files. For those in Linux and Windows who have to play with some of the compiler flags, those are set in here. Uh, you can see that there's some messages in here about what I need to comment in and out when I'm running it in Docker or natively on the Mac. This is actually what generates the make file. So there's some pre-compiler stuff that generates make files off this. And you'll see here, if you go to the make file, there's a little message at the top that it's, gen that it's a generated make file. So anything you change in here wouldn't actually be saved anyway. You've got to do it from inside the pre-rules if that's a step you ever get to. So the basic libraries are um, that you'd have to worry about are some to do with the assessment. Uh, the ecology, the economics, the harvest, and the management implementation. There are some others that can link the code to Bayesian belief networks or to other models. That's not something we're really going to cover uh, here today. There's also the process, oh, sorry, there's the main Atlantis um, directory with the very main routine in it. There's the management routines, the physics, and then some more linkers. This at util, uh, the convert Atlantis ones in particular, are the ones that deal with the parameterization, uh, creating it to XML files and then reading it into Atlantis. And there's some external libraries to do with netcdf proj4 sjw lib, uh, which stands for um, the statistics library that we use is pretty much all stored in sjw lib. The structure of each one of these libraries, if I use Ecology as an example, is that it has a whole bunch of .c and .o files. The .o files are the compiled versions of the .c, so you really only have to deal with the .c, and inside the include directory there'll be some .hs. So things you want to define and not change very often go in the .h, whereas the actual code with all the equations and stuff goes in the .c. Now, if we just step through the structure of the model, the main database, so to speak, the main data structure sits in Atlantis box model, which is an enormous file that has the structure of a lot of these files are that they have messages at the top that was for when we didn't have repository software back in the day and we had to say who'd done what. Then inside this Atlantis box model.h, there's a whole bunch of definitions for things that we want to have uh, as a macro or defined capacity somewhere else. So in some cases, it's dealing with um, file sizes. In other cases, it's dealing with particular dimensions. So instead of having to type this meaningless number at points in the code, for instance, when we're rounding and we want to make sure that we're careful about how we're rounding numbers, which is something you have to worry about and see. Instead of typing this meaningless number everywhere in the code, then if we ever want to change it, have to search for it. You can define it once here, and then you can use it throughout the code. And every time, see, this is all the places that it's used in the code. Every time, as C compiles, every time it finds that word, it'll switch in this number instead. 
So as a human, you can see something that's readable, but the code can deal much more efficiently with what it's doing. Okay. Um, there's even some routines to find in here, like maximum in minimum. In the old days of C, that was a routine that needed to be explicitly defined in some mass libraries. One of the most common kind of conversions it'll do is between milligrams and other units. So that's all defined in there. So that takes into account the carbon to nitrogen conversion and the wet weight to dry weight conversions uh, readily. Some of that now has been eased off a little bit so that you can have variable carbon to nitrogen ratios instead of Redfield, but that's the basic premise of it. One of the other things that Lannis does is that each of the parameter options in the model to make it very fast to find it inside the uh, species parameter or other parameter arrays, instead of having to do a search on the name, you just use an ID number to pluck the number straight out of the array. So all of those array value sizes are defined here. You can see there's an enormous list of them. So these, for instance, are all the recruitment options. So you can see here, each one of the recruit options has its own name. And that's again, so that every time the model sees that word, uh, the compiler sees that word in the code, it, it can switch in that number. But it, well, we have the human readable form. Uh, it's in a way that makes a lot more sense to us. So just to give you a little bit of an example, this is actually for a switch, a switch function, which we said we'd see a bit of. So when you're doing reproduction, there's quite a large number of reproduction options. There's 21 listed here. So instead of putting in 21 if statements, the switch statement allows you to do that for it. So you say the case that you mean, and it basically checks to see if this thing here matches the value that you've defined here. And we've given each of those values an English meaningful name so we can see what options we're talking about. If, if it succeeds, it does the piece of code till it sees a break. If you don't put a break between the cases, such as you can see there's no break here, it'll just go on and do the next case, even if it's done a calculation. So if I took this break here out, it would go through, do this calculation and then that calculation. So you have to be very careful about where you put your breaks to make sure that they're where they need to be for a specific calculation without having to chop off options. So these ones intentionally all use the same option, which is why there's only a single break here. After you've got all those hardwired definitions, the next thing Atlantis does is it creates a huge list of the uh, harvest fisheries parameters and the species parameters. Every single one is in this list. Now to create an ongoing list of this kind of form where you've got these hardwired numbers, but for every single one of these parameters would be an enormous thing to do. So what we do instead is we create a uh, type def, an enum. So that's an enumerated list. And so for each one of these, it starts with the value zero assigned here, and it just steps up through the list till it gets to the end. And here at the end, we've put in a counter. So that every time we create an array with this, we know we've got enough space for everything before it. So if we were to stick in a new parameter, And then it would be automatically stuck into that list and there would just be enough room in the arrays. So it means that you've got a lot less bookkeeping if you do it that way. Uh, and you can define the name of that enumerated list uh, at the end of the list. We do that for a whole bunch of the parameter arrays, like I said. So here's the one for things to do with vessels. Down here will be one to do with all of the ecology one. So you can see it's a quite an enormous list of parameters because it has to think of all the different parts for every different kind of behavior and every different part of the ecology. So not while there will be a slot for a value for every single species, in some species case those values make no sense for specific 
species. So that cell entry will just be an empty one, but we still need it anyway, just for ease of writing the code. So that's why having the species parameters um, enum uh, is quite useful. So there for parameters where there's only a single value per species, but you can also have cohort specific parameters which are used um, in their own array. So that's the main way that we store values. Now as to the actual data structure itself, you can have far more complicated structures. So for instance, in this particular case, um, it's around the structure for storing epibenthic information, so for animals that live on the sediment surface. So that's defining a structure rather than an en enum. And that structure is a bit like a, 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 um, a, a database or a, a data frame in R. So you can give it names, you can give it integer types, and for each part of that structure, every time diag info is called, it'll have those properties that you can call from it. So if we actually go down a bit further, there's a big structure called, so that's the, for the tiers, um, yep, info, ice model, there should be, box model which is hopefully there we go that's the one for an individual box so that's where it's defining for each box all of the properties that each box will have so this is all the information that's stored for any individual box in the model and you can see within that it has vectors so this is what this is appointed to a vector uh, for specific information on the volumes, the sources and sinks happening, the tracer array, so that's the, the values per layer per box that it stores, um, whether it's got land information. So you can see you can also refer to other structures. So in this case, this box structure it has got an instance of the land structure, the ice structure, the sediment structure within it. So once you've defined a structure, you can then use it within another one, like we just said. I'm just trying to find where, oh ah, here, the actual overall box model structure. This is the core heart of Atlantis. This is where it has, defines all of the names for the files it uses, all of the arrays uh, for any information that it's storing, the configuration parameters. So basically this is the very heart of Atlantis. You can see it's pretty huge. There's lots of integers. This is where all the flags are defined. And for each flag, we try to tell you what that flag is doing. Uh, we try to mirror here the information that's available in the documentation. And that's true for the parameters as well. So we try to give as much information content about what that structure is storing and the form that it's storing it in. You can see that some of the arrays it's storing are quite large in dimension. So four stars here means that this is a four dimensional array that it's storing. So it, that's why it can be such a, a memory hog. There's some big processes inside. That array goes on for quite, uh, sorry, that structure goes on for quite some time. But then at the very end, the bottom of that structure is called box model. And that's something that you'll see throughout the model being handed around from routine to routine. And that's because it's the core data structure of the model so that the calculations can suck out the values they need to go to. Under that, we have some, def some global variables that every single library needs to know about. And then some core routines that need to be called... Uh, at different points in the code so they need to be created sent name centrally and that's what this this is a definition of a routine and you would fill out its content in one of the c files so this is the basic structure of a routines definition it's the kind of routine and what it's expecting so in this case it's avoid the name of the routine which we try to make meaningful so in this case it's read the land data and then the things that will be passed into that routine. So you can see in a whole bunch of places this box model structure is being passed in, as well as some other parameters that will define what settings are inside that routine. Uh, if we now jump to having a look at what an example piece of code looks like, I'll see if I can find one that's slightly 
simpler a smaller piece of code so this is one for um, the amount of available catch from the prey that's coming in um, so this is so it can eat out eat out of the the, the catch as it comes in so you've got the box model structure so this is what it's called the available catch it's going to return a double so the box models come in it's got the guild case which in some places is called guild in some places is the species but it's basically the group that you're worried about it's the cohort of that species that you're dealing with it's that stage then you're worried about the prey that you're thinking about the prey's a cohort the size, the SN of the predator, uh, some information to do with biomass, which in this case is being stored in the species, an array called species. We often try to match the names going in that you see in this definition with the value, the names that they would be in that part of the code that's calling it. It's not always the case, so if you need to double check, you go back to where this is called. Um, and then you can see how it's being called. So in this case, the prey available is being set based on the call to avail catch. You've got all the properties that you're reading in. Uh, and you can see the second to last one here is a thing called vert info, which is often how where we store the biomasses of the age structured groups or the name of the array that we use to store that. Um, so you can see in this particular case, the name we're using in here doesn't exactly match what's on the higher up but you can always double check what it is the other interesting thing is it's got the stars which means you're passing into a whole array rather than a single value so you need to pass it the array the array name rather than an individual so this thing here is passing the individual value at that exact part of the array whereas this is part handing the whole array and this is the log file for your, your printouts that we mentioned previously so where um, it comes in of the array, it, it does what it's doing. It's looping over here, getting the values, getting the final value and passing it back. That's the general structure of the model. You can see it's done some local definitions here. It's got a comment on what the, the model's actually trying to do at this step. These kind of array setups are the fairly common one. We try to use the same name IDs as we go through. There'll be a little bit of variation in what we use as our counters. So here, fleet, prey, species, they're common counters. Sometimes you get IJK, but we do try to be relatively consistent in that. You see that most divisions have plus small number underneath. That's in case you ever get a zero, you don't want to divide by zero and C. So we put a very small number um, uh, at the end, which won't make a material difference to the calculation, but does mean you can avoid dividing by zero. It's defined in the box model .h, uh, which is that first file back here. You can see it's an absolutely tiny number. So it just means you're not dividing by zero. In this particular case, log FP was passed in. So you can just refer to it here. If it wasn't referred to, you can always use that instead, the BM log file. But if it's been defined, you might as well use it. Uh, some things, um, you don't have to pass in the same kind of things in each case. This is an example of a void routine. It's not passing something back. All the calculations it needs to make are made in here. In this particular case, it wants to pass back a value. So instead of having a double here, it's going to pass it back here instead. So you need the pointer to the value, not just passing a single value. Uh, it doesn't know how to interpret that, but it's resetting that value in here. So if we just look where that is in the code, um, it's calling it, so it's not making it equal to anything, it's just saying please do this exercise. You can see there's an ampersand here that's saying please pass in the array for that double, 
so that you can reset the value inside the other routine and then bring that reset value back with it. That kind of pointers and passing pointers is the most complicated part of C for many people. So don't be worried if you get a little bit confused about it. But basically, if this thing is not an array in the first place and you pass it with a pointer, it's because you want to do something with that value, change it and pass it back. If the thing is actually an array and you're passing in the star, that means you're passing in the whole array or that part of the array to play with. You do get used to it with time. Don't worry too much about it. Now, in terms of working with the code, you'll find there's lots of places where there's either an existing fprint that has a debug check around it. That's so that you can set your, the values in the run parameter file about when you want to have a check spat out and at what kind of topic area you want to know what's happening. That triggers it, setting those values in the run parameter file will automatically trigger this output. In other places where it's not common that people want to know about something, but we have had to think about it in the past, you'll see an existing fprint that's uh, commented out. So to reactivate it, you just take the comments off it and start again. You can compile and it'll be all good to go and you'll have that triggered. The main reason that we comment it out is if it's not used very often and it creates a lot of output or it can just plain slow things down to always be doing these checks um, and then doing an action can slow things down. So if it's not absolutely required, we tend to comment it back out. So I think that's the main features of the code to talk about right now. I'm sure that you'll have lots more questions as we go forward, but for now I'll pop back to the presentation and we'll go on to some of the things that you might need to know about in calibration. Now when you're calibrating the model there's a few things that you'll come across quite a lot. If you can fit to time series that's absolutely the best thing to do particularly if you can fit to multiple time series across different species and through space and time at the same time. But we often don't have that choice. So in that kind of case we don't have any information the best you can do is try and make sure you can at least keep the initial conditions stable. So when we say stable, that we mean plus or minus 20%. Plus or minus 10% is better, but it's often hard to do that. So plus or minus 20% is okay. Now that's a fairly, fairly arbitrary cutoff point, but it is based on the fact that if you look at natural variation or our capacity to sample natural variation, you often can't really tell that something's going on or something's different if it's less than a 10 to 20 percent change for things like fish and enlarged mammals and things like that. Once you're in the nutrients a 20 percent change is far more noticeable but for the most of the big things a 10 to 20 percent change is actually acceptable. Now what that looks like this is some example output where things have been calibrated well and they are keeping to that 10 to 20 percent. There's a bit of a burn in as they get their stuff together. Um, as it works its numerics out but in this the rest of the body of the projection they are fairly stable. This is an example of where it's not working well so your, your young of the year are doing okay maybe a little bit high but everything else is dying off so they're things to look for. So if we just step through some examples of that and how you can judge that one of the best ways of trying to think about your model performance is to think about some model skill set assessments the, these are some of the ones that um, uh, are found to work the best and being the most informative but are also being built into Javier's R tools. So the root mean square error is the one most people think about, so the sum of your squares. Um, you have to use that carefully if you think about the phasing side of things but it's still useful. Spearman rank correlation and seeing the correlation between your output and your input or your time series is really useful. This is one that a lot of people like to, to, to use to make sure there's a linear correlation between what the model is saying and what the observation is saying. And all of that can be brought together in a modeling, modeling efficiency index, which basically says if it's got a value of greater than zero, it means that the model is better at predicting the time series than just taking the average of 
the the past. Uh, if it's less than, if it equals zero, you might as well just take an average of the time series that you already have. If it's less than zero, you have something seriously wrong because the taking the average is better than what the model is doing. So these have been recommended not only by people doing ecosystem modeling, but a far more complicated modeling. And this is so that you can decipher what's going on. And that's because it's very easy for noisy information to fool the eye. So if you just look at this top line here, the open circles are observations or a, a pretend observational time series and the light blue line is the pretend model time series. So that's a perfect match. If you saw that, you'd be super pleased with yourself. This is actually, you get the variation right, you get the pattern right, you just offset wrong. So that's a different situation to many of the others. So you can see it would, it would have a good fit. It's just offset. This one's perfectly back to front. Your model's completely opposite to what's going on, which in a way you might be able to tell by eye. So things here are a bit high compared to where the model says that they are. But in a way, if it's just really noisy like this one or this completely uncorrelated state, the brain isn't very good straight out once they get lots of data points and saying actually that mess is not matching well in fact it wouldn't be able to really easily discern the difference between this one where you've got a perfect inverse relationship and just where there's general noise where there's no information content at all um, particularly when you start to get into situations like this where um, it's not just that uh, it's stepped away it's that it's not actually matching at all this one here, the eye also tends to like to say, oh, we got most of that right, when in fact we're not doing very well at all. So that's why it's good to actually use these metrics. The eye is good at picking out some things, like it can discern complete rubbish, um, or where people are being overly sensitive with the indicator. There was an example I can think of once where I sat in a meeting for many hours while people argued about whether a line put through this enormous cloud of points was significant or not. And it was quite clearly that, you know, it had no information to the content of the line. It was just the average of tens of thousands of points. And so the average was coming up as a significant predictor, but it was literally just because there was just such a huge cloud of points. So the eye can detect when there's being absolute ridiculousness like that but it's not very good at some of these more nuanced uh, problems particularly in noisy data so it's good to use the metrics now back to trying to troubleshoot some of the problems that you'll face um, one of the things you can see is the degree with what's happening at this in the younger age classes starts to transmit through the older age classes so this is an example where Everything's keeping relatively flat through time once you get through the initial uh, burn-in time. This is an example where your yeah, adult population is accumulating through time. And this is a case where very strong initial recruitment pulse has a lasting effect through the course of the model just due to the life history of that species. So these can all be dealt with in different ways. This is one where your classical burn-in and set of parameters can probably be deal with this similarly for this one. This one, you might want to run a much, much longer time series and get the stable state and refeed it in as a start, as we've talked about before. Now, in general, in thinking about what the most common kinds of problems you'll see, a few of you will get stuck into the nutrient dynamics. I'm not going to try to discuss that too much in the troubleshooting here because it tends to be a case-by-case -case basis around available nutrients and silica and light uh, and that kind of thing and even um, trophic ex uh, sorry current exchanges flows through the model the one but where most people spend a lot of time is looking at the age structured animals and how big they are so i'm just going to concentrate for a little while on troubleshooting those kind of problems because these are the ones we see absolutely the most whether you're using javier's tool or Excel or Olive or your own R scripts or whatever, what you'll see uh, some of the cases I'm about to show are some of the most common things you'll see. One of them is where your growth isn't really changing a lot, but you are seeing an accumulation in numbers through time. Not seen too often, you usually see more of a signal in the size than in this particular case, but if you do see this, then you need to increase your uh, mortality. 
The most common way of doing this is to increase your pea prey, but also to make sure you overlap with the predators. Um, you can use the background mortality ML and MQ a little bit, but you've got to be wary of doing that so you don't create too much non-dynamic predation. Otherwise, you just end up with a set of single species models all happening at the same time. Sometimes you do need to put in the ML if you don't have a fishery in your model yet, like you haven't set up your harvest perimeter file, but you want to represent a fish system simply in the calibration. Uh, but typically you try to keep ML and MQ as close to zero as possible and put most of your effort through the prey uh, matrix, availability matrix. The more common cases that you start to see are things where you see a drop in numbers through time, starting off with the smaller size classes and then going it making its way through the larger size classes there's enough numbers you're just not getting enough babies uh, sorry enough size you're just not getting enough babies uh, and to deal with that you need to increase recruitment so that's by changing uh, the the sheer number of babies you get out of recruitment function the two most common recruitment functions being a fixed number of babies per adult in which case you'd play with your KDNR parameter uh, the other one is often the Beverton Holt or modified Beverton Holt, which you'd probably want to play with your BH Alpha more than anything else. But it really does come down to your recruitment function and which one you're using. The other option is to decrease predation. I tend not to do this unless it's really excessive predation because you want to make sure that your dynamics and your predation are a key part of centre to the model. It, it can be that, but it's more often the recruitment. If you see this sign of sawtooth measure, that's actually not something wrong with the model. It just means that your time step is typically shorter than a year. So you're outputting information shorter than a year. So you've got the numbers grow and then they come down to the next age class as they age and then the numbers grow again. So it should be a bit more asymmetric than the way I've drawn it there. But that is literally just down to an aliasing with your reporting and it's really just the same situation as that one. Uh, another common one is where you've actually got fine numbers at size, fine uh, size at age, but you have one particular age group that's dropping out, particularly an older age group. That's typically to do with predation, whether that's fishing mortality or predation by predators, and that you'd be just dialing back mortality to get to that. So lower L, ML and MQ if you've got that, or your fishing mortality rates uh, if you're getting sufficient catch. Uh, or predation. Then we start to get into some of the, the trickier ones where for instance you've got the numbers look okay for recruitment but they're too so small, instantaneously too small. The most common cause for that is because your initial conditions and your size of recruitment don't match. You really want your initial conditions and the size of recruitment to, to match or at least uh, if you have very small recruits coming in, they've got to grow fast enough so they can get up to the average size of your first cohort and your initial conditions uh, reasonably quickly. So it's usually just safer to set the, the, the recruitment size reserve and recruitment size structure at the same value as the initial conditions that you set for those, that class age class zero for that species. The next one is where they're not growing enough. The average size is declining through time. Now that might be seen with a high number of individuals or a, a low number of individuals. If it's seen with a low number of individuals because starvation is reducing the numbers, you've got M starve set to a number greater than zero. If on the other hand you see this, it's because they're competing so much that there's not enough left food left. So counterintuitively, instead of making them grow faster, you actually want to kill them off because then there'll be more food and there'll be more of them. So your initial instinct is usually to change growth and consumption in these cases. And if they're starving, that's usually a good way of doing it. But when you see this other kind of case, you might actually want to, to think about killing some of them off. So reduce recruitment or increase uh, mortality. Uh, you should also check, particularly in the starvation case, whether the predator and prey are overlapping. If this is a predator and it's declining, it may be because it can't access enough prey. Uh, 
This is definitely the case um, where you've got too many and you really need to think about uh, getting rid of some of the numbers so that that reduces competition. Like I said, you can do that through recruitment or increasing predation. Uh, it's actually got little to do with uh, the way that they grow. The next one is that you start to see a massive reduction in recruitment as your adult size goes down. And that's because they're literally just not fat enough to recover the materials they lose when they spawn. This is a mistake that people often make because they think adults don't grow. Anyone who's gone through the middle age spread will know that adults do continue to grow. They just tend to grow out rather than up. And so in Atlantis, they use that fat to do the spawning. And so if they can't recover it, they can't reproduce. And that's what you're seeing here. The, the younger age classes are fine, but when they get to adulthood, they spawn the first time um, and there's not enough spawn left. So from then on, recruitment fails. So in that case, you actually want to be looking at the growth rates of the adults. In this kind, this particular case, you've got lopsided growth where the structural reserve, the structural growth is fine, but your fatty, your reserve tissue isn't doing real good. And eventually you get uh, a loss of recruitment because the adults are too small or don't have good enough condition. And that's a case where you can actually play with the preferential way that they grow. Do they put more energy into recovering their fatty tissues or into somatic growth? And you can tailor that for individual groups to try and rectify this particular problem. When you get to biomass pools, it's a lot. In one way, it's simpler. You don't have to look at quite so many diagnostics. In one way, it's tougher because it's all just in together. So you have to play with a combination of growth and predation, usually by looking at what's a reasonable value versus a number for that species, how much predation or prey uh, interactions are occurring so that you can see which of the parameters is most likely to be erroneous and then tackle that. So I hope that's given you a little bit of a sense of some of the steps to think about in calibrating, some of the most common problems to tackle in calibrating um, and the way of actually getting your fingers into the code. But the thing to kind of remember is you concentrate on your ecology first by playing whack-a-mole, as we discussed earlier, where you play with the most, at any one point in time, the thing that's most wrong, and then you look to see how it's going and then tackle the thing that's mo next most wrong instead of trying to get something perfect from the start. Once you have your system largely biologically uh, matching reality, then you put in your fishing time series or other stresses uh, to make sure that the the modelled system can support that level of pressure. Then you start to fit to historical time series and that's really important because lots of studies have shown that where Atlantis is actually fit to data, it's a good model, but just being ecologically logical doesn't mean that it will actually deliver great values if it's data free. So you do need to try and do fitting wherever possible and once you've got all of those then you can start doing management strategy evaluation. Now the model has value at any one of those steps whether it's ecological understanding or just getting fishing in there for scenario analysis but to go the whole hog you really need to, to have tried to calibrate the whole way through. Anyway thank you.